Good morning. I want to welcome you to Church Without Religion. My name is Andrew Farley. I'm the pastor here. Uh, Today we start a new series in the book of Jude, which in fact is no series at all. It's only going to take one week as there's only one chapter. So today we will be covering Jude in its entirety. It's an epistle that I've never taught on before. Uh, in this church. So I'm excited about it this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for your word and your spirit. We just ask that you would minister to us today in a powerful way. We give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I've titled this message, Fight for Truth, and it is a study in the book of Jude. And so as we look at the very beginning here, we find out who Jude is. There's some debate about his identity. Nevertheless, he tells us that he is a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and it also says he is the brother of James. This would likely make him the half-brother of Jesus. And so it reads like this, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. It is uh, very appropriate that we're looking at the book of Jude after just finishing our series in 2 Peter. Uh, They have very similar themes. In fact, uh, this book is designed to preserve the truth and fight against error. And so Jude will be pointing out all kinds of error in the church, things that have crept in. And you'll notice how he uses this language even from the beginning He talks about those who were beloved in God the Father. And you'll notice this very dear word, dear to our hearts, this word kept. The idea that Jesus Christ is the one who is keeping you. In fact, God the Father is keeping you for Jesus Christ. This reminds me of when Paul writes and he says that we are hidden with Jesus Christ in God. That is, we are kept, we are preserved, we are held We are enveloped. We are in a safe place. This word kept says a lot about our salvation, doesn't it? We wonder, can I mess it up? And the answer is no, your salvation is kept for you. Uh, Can I miss out on eternal life by flubbing it up, by messing up my track record? No, you are being kept for Jesus Christ. Who is your keeper? Who is the one keeping you? God the Father is the one keeping you. And no one can snatch you out of his hand. So even from the beginning, we see uh, this idea of, of security in Jesus Christ, of being eternally safe in him. And you'll notice also these words in verse 2, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. We saw this in Second Peter as well, that a true knowledge of, of God would result in grace and mercy and grace and mercy and grace upon grace upon grace and stability and peace of mind and rest in him. And we're seeing the same thing here as Jude opens his letter, mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. So this is some really good news for Christians. Number one, we are dearly loved. We're beloved We've been called to the table. We get to feast on all of God's goodness. We all have a calling, a destiny. God has equipped us. We're designed for new things now. We're beloved in Him, and we're also reserved. We're safe. We're secure. We're kept in Him. And as He's keeping us in Him, we can expect peace and love and mercy to be multiplied to us because that's just how good he really is. All right, well, it goes on. It says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. In other words, you have something precious And I want you to fight for it. I want you to fight for truth. I don't want you to be duped. I don't want you to be tricked. I don't want you to be distracted by other tantalizing options that involve a false freedom. Peter spoke about this false freedom. Here Jude also addresses it. Earnestly contend 
for the faith. That sounds like an active life in which I'm choosing truth, I'm rejecting error on purpose, and I'm also helping others by encouraging them in the truth of the gospel. So what is the truth of the gospel? The truth of the gospel involves grace and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. The truth of the gospel involves being kept, being held safely in Him. And so we need to contend for these things and fight for these things and not settle for less. The gospel is incredible. It deserves our attention and it certainly deserves preservation. And so Jude is saying here, it was once for all handed down, handed down from God to the apostles, to the saints. The early church now has it. What are we going to do with it? He is saying, please, let's keep it. Let's preserve it. Let's contend. Let's fight for it because it's so very precious And so very important. And people in this congregation know that, don't we? We know how much we cherish the truth of God's word. We don't want anybody messing with it. We don't want anybody compromising it. We don't want anyone uh, belittling it. We don't want anyone watering it down. Jesus Christ deserves our full respect. His blood sacrifice deserves our honor. His resurrection deserves our attention. And we all the more have this privilege of not only preserving it, but sharing and encouraging one another in this incredible news. And so this is what Jude is worried about. He is worried about people missing the mark, ending up in error, being tricked and duped by outsiders who have infiltrated the church, and they're trying to mess with the message. All right, verse 4 explains this concern, certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So if you want to know what two ideas here are occurring in the book of Jude. They, in fact, rhyme with one another. First, we see we are kept, and then then we see that they have crept. They have crept in. So Jude is is pronouncing uh, condemnation upon those who have crept in, and then he's also saying that we believers are kept by God's mighty hand. So the idea of being kept and the idea that they have crept in and messed everything up This sums up a lot of what Jude has to say in this single chapter. Now, you'll notice that it's calling them ungodly persons. So clearly, these are unbelievers, and they have twisted and warped the grace of God. And in this case, they're not telling you you need to go out and perform well. That would be legalism, telling you you need to go out and perform well in order to get God to like you. That is an error. But this error here is the opposite. They are saying it doesn't matter how you perform. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter how you act. It doesn't matter what you harbor in terms of resentment and bitterness. Go ahead and be a jerk to people. Go ahead and be rude to people. Go ahead and be unloving. Go ahead and be selfish. Go ahead and do whatever you like. Follow your five senses. Uh, Follow whatever your body tells you to do, so to speak, and don't worry about it because nothing matters. So this was the false freedom that people were twisting the grace of God into. Now, I beg you to consider this, much like in Romans 6, where Paul is clarifying, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? That was the sort of thing that these guys were saying. So consider that, and then consider this. Only the true gospel would result in this kind of distortion by some people. In other words, if I stood up here every single Sunday and said, you better not sin because God is ticked off at you. You better not sin because you'll be out of fellowship. You better not sin because God will turn his back on you. You better not sin because you'll lose your salvation. Then nobody could ever twist my words into that. No one could ever twist such legalism into licentiousness. 
But if I were to get up here every single Sunday, which I often do, and say that you are secure and you are safe because of the love and the grace and the kindness of God and that Jesus Christ took away your sins once for all and that he remembers them no more and that you're a brand new creation with a new heart, all your sins forgiven and a brand new identity. So now let's live from that and be inspired by God. Well, somebody is going to hear that delete the last part of it where I said, now let's depend on Christ and let him be expressed. Somebody's going to delete that part of the message and then run around saying, Farley says, and that church over there says, behavior doesn't matter. We can just do whatever we want and there's no consequences, no concerns, no big deal. God doesn't care. So do you see that It is only the grace of God and His forgiveness and His kindness and His patience and His mercy. It is only the gospel of grace that could potentially be distorted into this licentiousness message that they were seeing 2,000 years ago. So make no mistake, the apostles were all preaching the grace of God, and that was the message being twisted. They were certainly not teaching an if-then legalism. They were not teaching loss of salvation. They were not teaching God is mad at you. They were not teaching God in a swivel chair because such ideas could never, ever be twisted into this licentiousness message. They were running around saying, you've got a license to sin. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Legalism is never twisted into that. Only the authentic grace of God is twisted in such ways by people of depraved mind. And so... He is saying here that these are ungodly persons and they've taken the true message of grace and they've twisted it and they're denying our only master and Lord. Do you notice they are denying our master and Lord? So it's our master and Lord, but they are denying him. So they are not believers. These are not Christians who have gone AWOL. In a minute, we're going to see that they are devoid of God's spirit. All right, verse 5 Now, I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Now, there's much in this verse. As short as it is, there's much in this verse. I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all. What can that even mean? You know, the phrase once for all is reminiscent of all the passages in Hebrews, for example, where Jesus' sacrifice is described. He died for our sins once for all. He cleansed us once for all. All of this once for all talk is reminiscent of that. So what is that verbiage doing here? Well, this also reminds me of when we're told that we will all know the Lord. Under the new covenant, we will all know the Lord from the least to the greatest, from the little kiddo up to the Bible scholar. We will all have an innate, intuitive knowledge of who the Lord is. We won't have to be getting our master's and PhDs in order to understand and know the Lord. We won't have to be of a high IQ in order to know the Lord. And so what we're seeing here is a very similar thought. I'm going to remind you of the gospel and remind you about what God hates concerning sin and remind you about what God loves concerning you. Nevertheless, there is a sense in which you, believer, you intuitively know the Lord and know all things that are in Him. Now he goes on and he says, "...subsequently destroyed those who do not believe." Well, that's an Old Testament story, but it's making a point about what God did and what God thinks of sin, what God thinks of unbelief, what God thinks of people who reject him. And so we go on and he says, and angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he is kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Rebellion. Rebellion uh, on the part of those who didn't obey in the Old Testament. Rebellion concerning these angels who fell and didn't keep their own domain. Rebelled against God. And there is a punishment we have seen so far. Words regarding punishment, darkness, judgment. 
this comes upon those who reject it. So again, we find it very hard to believe these people today that are pushing this idea that everyone is okay, I'm okay, you're okay, they're okay, everyone's in Christ, no one will be judged, no one will be punished, no one will be condemned. All of that does not seem to stack up here as we're looking at this passage in Jude, which seems quite clear. There's a comparison beginning in verse 7, look at this, Sodom and Gomorrah. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal life. So they're exhibited as an example. An example to who? To the people living in the day in which this letter was written. Sodom and Gomorrah from way back when is now an example for people living in that present day. Which people? The people that are tricking Christians, the false teachers, the false prophets, those who are promising a false freedom, those who are saying behavior doesn't matter at all, God doesn't care, come enjoy this life of freedom, freedom to sin, oh isn't sin great. So these people are devoid of the Spirit, deceiving many, leading them into gross immorality, even going after strange flesh. You can imagine what that might be. Uh, lots of options there. And so uh, you see that it says they're exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Uh, there's all kinds of Facebook theologians. There's all kinds of people that are pushing ideas all over the web, all over the internet, as if, as if they're experts and they can discount what we clearly see in the Bible in some cases. We're told that, oh, hell was just an invention hundreds of years later coming out of Italy. The idea of hell, oh, it came from, it came from the inferno. It came from here. It came from there. It was just meant to be a trash dump in Jerusalem. And boy, have we flubbed it up in our depiction of hell well, let me tell you, as you go through Jude, as you look at uh, Peter talking about the blackness, the darkness, uh, there is a punishment of some kind, and it certainly seems to involve a darkness, and sometimes there's a fire mentioned. Uh, it's called an eternal fire. Uh, so these are not the inventions of Catholics who came later or scholars who came later. This is not the invention of a creative human mind. This is clearly what Scripture is saying, not just in one book of the Bible, but throughout many, many, many books of the Bible in dozens of references. All right, so he says, In the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. They're cursing out angels, even demons. They're addressing these angelic majesties and they have something to say to them in their arrogance. They, they don't even know what they're talking about, but they seem to be interested in fighting spiritual powers and making a big deal of their words and confronting angelic beings and demons. Verse 9, but Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, isn't that interesting that this example is given here that Michael, not even Michael, that is the emphasis here, not even the archangel Michael in all his glory, in all his greatness, when he disputed with Satan, he used the name of the Lord and said, The Lord rebuke you, not I rebuke you, not I have power over you, not I'm a big deal, not oh look at me and how powerful I am, but instead I'm dependent on the Lord, not myself. And it's interesting to note that because how many times today have we been told to speak it, to name it, and claim it, and cast it, and do it, and confront it, and rebuke it, and we get all focused on the enemy. And many flavors of Christianity end up talking more about the enemy than they do about Jesus Christ. And it's all about their power and their miracles and look at me and what I'm doing and... His point here is, 
what place do we have with that frame of mind? Even the, even the archangel Michael uh, did not act in such a way. Now, there's an obvious dilemma here about this body of Moses dispute. What do we know about that? Well, we don't know much. Uh, there's a lot of theories about what this argument looked like. Uh, in the Old Testament scriptures, we don't have anything on this argument. Here's what we do know from the Old Testament. We know that God buried Moses, that God himself found a burial site for Moses, and that God buried Moses. And so then uh, that implies that while the body of Moses laid there in that resting place in the ground, that apparently Satan has had some sort of argument after that about Moses. Now, you know, our best guess might be that Satan is an accuser, and he accuses us day and night, and certainly he hated Moses and had some accusations to hurl at him. So maybe, just maybe upon his death, uh, Satan is seeking to bring out the file drawer on Moses. Hey, don't you remember when Mo did this? Hey, don't you remember when Moses did this? And so perhaps there was a dispute about the body of Moses, whether he was deserving. You could see the accuser. Imagine him saying that Moses was not deserving of resurrection, was not deserving of salvation because of this and this and this and this, and this is the sort of game that the accuser plays. Nevertheless, we don't have an account, a firsthand account of what took place there other than this stray verse right here in the book of Jude. So the big takeaway here is not a lot of detail about the dispute, but look at how Michael the archangel behaved himself, leaning on the Lord and trusting in the Lord's power to rebuke the enemy. All right, verse 10, but these men revile the things which they don't understand. That means angels and demons. They don't understand these beings, but they revile them. And the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Ignorance. These men are ignorant. They are acting like authorities when they have no authority. They are acting like truth tellers when all they're doing is communicating lies. They are acting like they have the market cornered on freedom, but when you invest in their message, all that you end up getting is immorality and discontent. And so he talks about them like unreasoning animals. Verse 11, woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And so we have these Old Testament references. I'm sure you're familiar with Cain who killed Abel. That would involve murder. And then we have the error of Balaam. I talked about Balaam earlier in the series on 2 Peter, how he sought to uh, dissuade the Israelites and persuade them toward immorality, warping God's message and inviting them to all kinds of open sin. And some of them were duped. And then it goes on to say, and perished in the rebellion of Korah, another Old Testament figure who sought to persuade people toward immorality. And so we've got these three figures from the Old Testament who were used as examples as this is an epistle written to Jewish people who would know this history in the Old Testament, the history of rebellion and what happened to those people when they rebelled. And so he uses them as examples. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, Clouds without water, a great analogy. Try that one out sometime. Hey, that dude's a cloud without water. Carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. Sound like a Christian? No, they are not in Christ. They are doubly dead. Now that sounds pretty dead. You know, it's not like the Monty Python, I'm not quite dead yet. This is the opposite of that. They're double dead. So they're double dead, clouds without water. In a minute, we'll see they don't have the spirit. So you can see how these sort of analogies, this colorful language is showing you, don't pay attention to dead people. Don't learn from spiritually dead people. 
Verse 13, wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom, here it is again, the black darkness has been reserved forever. We saw a similar terminology in 2 Peter, this black darkness. Again, those who were pushing the idea, don't worry, we're all safe. There are no unbelievers. Everybody's counted the same. No need to respond to the gospel. No judgment, no punishment. It's all going to be, you know, wrath is really just love. Fire is just a purifying fire. Don't worry. All of that verbiage can sound very convincing for about a minute until you dig into God's word and find these phrases that are undeniable. The black darkness has been reserved for them. And for how long? Forever. Doesn't sound like they're coming out of it. Verse 14, it was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied saying, behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict, get this, to convict whom? All the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, here we are looking at a quote, but it's relevant. He tells us it's relevant for the people of his day to whom he is writing. He is saying, this is what those deniers, this is what those false teachers are going to experience and so there's judgment and there's conviction. Now let me say a word about this, this idea of conviction. I have often noted that for believers, that for those who are born again, that for children of God, God is not convicting us as if we're convicts. That word is a loaded word, man. I mean, you run around saying, God really convicts me. God has convicted me. That can mean five things to five people. Some people don't know much of a difference between the idea of conviction and then the idea of condemnation. So we have to be very sensitive that we really portray the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is. If God is bringing up a bit of counsel concerning our behavior, he also knows that he's not counting our sins against us, that he remembers our sins no more, but that he's training us for the future. And so discipline, the discipline of the Lord is training for the future, but it's not punishment for the past. And so when we run around saying the Lord Jesus Christ does not convict us of, of sins, we need to be careful that we're not teaching people wrongly that behavior doesn't matter or that our choices are irrelevant. Nothing could be further from the truth. Behavior does matter and choices are important and the Lord is disciplining us. He's discipling us. He's training us toward a better future. But at the same time, he is not holding our past against us. He is not treating us as convicts. And so the most common use of this word convict today is relative to convicts. We talk about a person in Hollywood, for example, who was convicted of a crime. They became a convict. Now they're serving their sentence, maybe even the death penalty. And then we turn right around and say, God is convicting me. And many people may not understand what we're saying. It's interesting that the word convict here is used for the ungodly, not the godly. The ungodly are mentioned four times here, I believe. Convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so clearly the conviction, the dealing with them as convicts and then levying the punishment on them, it's clearly for those who are sinners, not saints. They are ungodly, not godly. They are in Adam, not in Christ. And so this is how we see the word convict used here. Jesus used the word convict in a very similar way, didn't he? He said, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will convict who? He will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And why, why would he convict the world of sin? 
It says, because they do not believe in me, Jesus said. So they are unbelievers who do not believe in Jesus, and God convicts them of their sin of unbelief. Again, this word convict used in this way. So I'm not saying that behavior is irrelevant or unimportant or that God doesn't counsel us, tutor us, teach us, instruct us, guide us into all truth, mold us, shape us, mentor us, discipline us, disciple us. He absolutely does those things. The role of the Holy Spirit is undeniable in our lives, but he will never ever treat you as a convict who has been convicted of crimes, you have been set free and there is therefore now no condemnation for you. So as he trains you up for the future, he is reminding you that your sins are forgiven and forgotten forever. And that's a big deal. And it's actually motivating. It changes the way we think about our identity, about our forgiven state. And it also then impacts our daily choices. So God has got this thing figured out. He is a loving mentor. He is a forgiving tutor. He is a gracious God who guides us into all truth. Verse 16, these though, these guys are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. Ever met somebody like that? They're buttering you up, but as soon as you turn, it's a knife in your back. These people exist even today, don't they? And in a spiritual way, they were doing this sort of thing 2,000 years ago, and Jude is warning about them. Verse 17, but you... But you believers, but you beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. Again, we're playing this us-them game. Jude is very careful. He is saying, but you, I wasn't talking about you a minute ago, but now you, beloved believers, hey, let me grab your attention for a minute. Don't you remember that you've been warned about those people over there? And so he's very clear about the us versus the them. Verse 19, these are the ones who cause divisions. They are worldly minded. Here it comes, devoid of of the Spirit. If someone does not have the Spirit, they do not belong to God. These are unbelievers, not born again. They don't have a new heart. They don't have a new spirit. They don't have God's Spirit. They are unregenerate. They are still in Adam and clearly misleading God's children. All right, verse 20, but you, again, he goes back to the but, but hey, you, beloved Christians, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So much here that we could talk about, but I want you to see, first of all, he has targeted Christians in this verse. And the first thing he tells you is you can expect to be built up in the gospel. The gospel is not tearing you down. The gospel is not ripping you apart. The gospel is not about breaking you and watching you break. The gospel is truly about you being built up in Jesus Christ. Notice that it says your most holy faith. We don't often use that expression, my most holy faith. But you can see here that the point is your faith is set apart Your faith is sacred. What you believe is a big deal. It's precious, so hold on to it. It is most holy. Preserve it. Contend for it. Fight for truth. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Does that mean I have to go off in a foreign language, an angelic tongue? Is that what it is? No, in context here, there's no mention of other languages. It's not about speaking like an angel. Of course, Paul says that in hyperbole one time. He says, even if, even if I could move mountains, 
beaming a mountain across the sky. Even if I spoke with the tongues of angels, well, if I didn't have love, what would it profit me? So apparently speaking in love is the big deal, not speaking in foreign tongues. Paul never beamed a mountain across the sky and he never gave his body to be burned and also he never spoke in an angel language either. And so this was all hyperbole. So when we see these five words here, it's tempting for us to think of something far off and magical and difficult to find or achieve. But remember, praying in the Spirit is this. You, child of God, are in the Spirit. It is your location. It is your position. It is your place. You are in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in you, and this is true of you always. And so praying in the Spirit is simply a description of how a Christian can pray. I can pray knowing that the mind of Christ dwells within me. I can pray knowing that even when I don't have the right words, that the Spirit intercedes for me in my heart with groanings that are too deep for words. So it's not mama bought a Honda and daddy bought a Honda. There are no words. It's too deep for words. There are no angel words. There are no words in, in Greek or Hebrew or Russian or Chinese. There are no words because at that point, the groanings of God's spirit are too deep for any words in any language. And so praying in the Spirit is simply recognizing I'm in the Spirit, He's in me, and I'm seeking His wisdom even as I pray. Keeping yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus. Wake up every day, say, God, show me your love. Show me your love. Teach me your love. Expose to me what you think of me. Have your spirit bear witness with my spirit. Show me how loved I am so that I can live loved. All right, well, as we conclude here, he says, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Oh, man, how have we beat up people who are doubting? Oh, you're doubting? You're probably not really saved. Oh, you're doubting? Well, then you never were a Christian. Oh, you're doubting? Look, struggling with doubting thoughts is the same as struggling with any other thoughts. Some people struggle with this temptation. It might be lust. Other people struggle with critical spirit type thoughts, being critical of other people. Other people struggle with doubt. And so the enemy can serve us any thought at any time, and doubt is no different. He says, have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Are the doubters the ones who need to be saved? No, look at it carefully. The doubters are just struggling with doubt, but they're already saved. Notice it says, have mercy on those who are doubting. And then it says, save others, snatching them out of the fire. So some are just doubting, but they're saved. Others are actually destined for punishment right now, but you have the ability to communicate truth to them and offer them a way of rescue, a way of salvation. All right, verse 24, he's finishing up. He says, now to him who is able to keep you. Remember the theme of being kept? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. What a beautiful verse this is for those who have wondered, am I safe? Am I okay? Might I lose out? Have I lost it? Look at what he says. It's all on God. Your salvation and your security is God's problem. Your security, your safety in Him is God's agenda. It's God's job to keep you safe. And it says He is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand. People always ask about the Re book of Revelation. You know, Will I be there? Will I be one of the ones who was able to stand? The Bible says he is able to make you stand. And that is beautiful. You are not strong. You are strong in the power of his might. And he living within you is able to make you stand. And also you'll notice he presents you blameless. That means there's not going to be any blame going around in heaven. 
when you are at that final judgment, it is a pass fail. It is black and white and it is beautiful. There will be no one to accuse and no one to blame because the blood of Jesus Christ has set you free and you are blameless. What would he blame you for? Your sins. What has he done with your sins? He has taken them away forever. That's why we can have great joy, Jude says. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this letter, brief as it is. It is so beautiful, so powerful. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and all that he means to us. We thank you for the new heart, the new spirit, your spirit living within us. Thank you, Father, that we are the godly, that we can sometimes look in and read other people's mail. We can see and hear descriptions about other people who are not in you. And yet we can know our destiny is different. Our destiny is firm, as safe, and secure. Father, we thank you that you enable us to stand. That we are kept. We are kept for Jesus Christ by you, Father. We thank you for these incredible truths. Most of all, we just thank you for your great love that you will never, ever let us go. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.